Good morning. It's great to see all you here in person. I also want to give a special shout out to those joining us online for the service today. Uh, to you, Aberdeen and Watertown and here, and I pray that God richly blesses you as you join us. Um, I want to begin with uh, some personal thoughts today before I jump into uh, another message from the Gospel of John. We live in these uh, strange, strange times. And I, I think I would begin to characterize the times we live in now with several words. And the words would be words like this, confusion. Man, I almost am irritated listening to the news anymore. There's so many contradictory things being said and so many things that are said that are simply just not true. And uh, it's, so it's kind of a confusing time. Lots of different opinions. What I've noticed is there's a lot of anger going on now, frustration uh, as the longevity of this thing sets in, that it's not going away soon. And people are getting frustrated and, and uh, lots of a heated discussion about whether we should open up, not open up, when, when should we wear masks, when should we not wear masks. All this kind of stuff can percolate to uh, what I would call boiling points very quickly. <laughs> and then there's just a lot of frustration. I think initially people thought, well, this will last a couple weeks and then we'll get back to normal, Right? And now we know there is no normal, amen? And it's going to go on probably for a long time. And we have to figure out how to do life with it. And polarization in our country is at an all-time high. There's polarization within the church over issues. There's polarization uh, in a secular side of our culture like crazy. And so here's what I want to say to you this morning. Just a couple words come to my mind for us as the people of God. One, we truly need people who exhibit the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, right? We're going to talk on that today. We're going to talk on joy a lot today. We truly need to exhibit that as, as Christ followers. And secondly, here's what I want to encourage you individually. And that, this is my word of the month. Flexibility. Amen? I just need to be flexible. You need to be flexible. What we do needs to have that word flexibility just built into it. How we do church, we need to be flexible. Things are going to change. We're going to do things differently. What's going on this week may not be going on next week. The way we look today may not be the way we look tomorrow. That's going to be true for your personal life. That's going to be true for how you shop. You know, there's places that are going to say you have to wear a mask. If you don't like it, go shop someplace else. You know, it's just going to have to have flexibility. We're just going to have to be flexible people. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, and so that's all I want to say on that. Be calming and be flexible. Be the people of God. Let the fruit of the Spirit come forth in your life. Now, we've been in a series of messages from the Gospel of John since uh, Christmas. And these teachings of Jesus are so insightful and so powerful. Next week, we're going to actually wrap up this series. It took us several months, but we're going to wrap it up uh, using John chapter 17 and the prayer of Jesus for himself, for his disciples, and for all believers. Um, it's really a powerful chapter, so I want to encourage you to tune in. Um, there are four more chapters to John, so you're wondering maybe why, why are we stopping in John chapter 17? Well, because the last four chapters of John are on his crucifixion, on Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, and guess what? We cover that every Easter. And so we'll get to that, and we're not going to include that as part of this series, all right? We're going to move into a series from the book of Galatians. Um, we, though, are in these last words of Jesus right now, before his crucifixion, and they're kind of really important words. They're very insightful and full of life and truth. Jesus is preparing us for the way things are going to be. Last week, we, we looked at some givens of Christianity that if you're a Christ follower, just like he was rejected, he was resented, and just like so much of the world is ignorant to him and hostile to him, we too are going to experience those very same kinds of things. Jesus is preparing us to understand where we are and what, what, what's up in life. And we shouldn't be surprised by these things. But to be known by God is of greater worth than being popular and accepted by this world. Amen? And that's kind of where we ended last week. Now, as Jesus gets really close to the crucifixion, and now as we get further on into John, into chapter 16, we're going to see that he's going to talk on this topic of joy. In the midst of all this, he says, you're going to experience this joy 
and it's going to be unstoppable in you, and it's going to be a fruit of the Holy Spirit for those who follow after him. Now, once again, and, and, and right before what, what I'm going to read to you today, for, for the third time, major time, Jesus talks in the Gospel of John about his departure and then the coming of the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's just powerful stuff. I've talked on the Holy Spirit two times already in this series, uh, way back in um, January 12th. Like the second week of the, of, the, of, the, of the series, we talked on the baptism of the person of the Holy Spirit. And then on June 28th, we talked on love, obedience, and, and the Holy Spirit. So if you have questions on the Holy Spirit, I would greatly encourage you, uh, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person, just to go back and, and look at those messages. They're, they're in our media section of our webpage. They're easy to find if you missed them. Um, because today, I guess what? I'm not talking on that. What I'm instead talking on is a result of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that result should be joy. A joy that's unstoppable, a joy that's unquenchable. And so we're going to get into the reading today, but I just wanted to qualify that. If, you ha if you're wondering about the person of the Holy Spirit and, and how he fits into the Trinity and how, he, how he, he, he's involved in our lives, those two messages that I talked about, do cover that to some degree. Uh, listen to the scripture I'm going to read today. I'm going to read from John chapter 16, verses 17 through 24. Hear the scripture, and, and it's about joy, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. At this, Jesus talking about his departure and all that kind of thing, some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to what? Joy. A woman given birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of the joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. You know why? Because he isn't here physically. They're, they're not going to have that same intimate relationship, that same face-to-face -face relationship. Very true, they tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you receive, and your joy will be complete. So Jesus makes it clear here, amen, that there's going to be this time of grief and mourning. He's going to depart. He's going to be crucified. And that they're going to be just sorrowful over that. But it will quickly turn to joy upon what? His resurrection. When he's raised from the dead. And then we know that the Holy Spirit will come on the day of Pentecost and fill the new believers with, with God himself. And part of the fruit of the Spirit, we're told, is this thing called joy. So let's read Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, because it talks about fruit of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul talking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. What's the second one? Joy. Peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the very things, brothers and sisters, we ought to be demonstrating in the midst of COVID-19. If we're filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. Against such things, there is no law. Now, we've covered love a lot in this series. If you've been around, we've talked about love several times. Joy is a second fruit mentioned in this listing of Galatians 5, and it deserves a moment also. And that's what we're going to give it here today. Note this. Understand this. Hear this, please, from me. Love and joy and these kinds of things are all fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you're lacking them in your life, what you do is you ask the God who gives all good gifts to give you these fruit. You ask, Holy Spirit, Give me the fruit of love. Holy Spirit, give me the fruit of joy. How many of you are familiar with Winnie the Pooh? Some of you will raise your hands. Some of you will never raise your hands. I mean, Jesus himself could be standing here and say, raise your hand. You go, nope, don't do that. Not me. Never raise my hand. Anyway, sorry. 
So if you're familiar with Winnie the Pooh, it's a story of a little boy and the stuffed animals on a 100-acre farm. And there are 100-acre woods, I should say it right. And in these stories, you have two personalities that I get a kick out of that are uh, kind of polar opposites. And some of you know where I'm going with this already. You've got Tigger, right? He's a tiger with a bouncy tail, and he's always joyous. Woo-hoo, right? He does that all the time. Don't you do that when you read it to your kids? Shame on you. When you read to your kids, you need to act it out. And then you got who? Eeyore. A gloom and doom donkey. He's always upset. So here's my question for you, and especially if you have some kids with you, and you could talk about this when you get home. And if you're online, you could talk about it right now, because I'm not there. You can do whatever you really want to do. If you're at home, in church here present, please show some restraint. At any rate, are you an Eeyore, or are you a Tigger? Which one of those words would better capture who you are? Now, I'm going to be honest. I got a strange mixture of both in me because I can get real silly really fast, but I can be a pretty good gloom and doom guy. How about you? I can really get down really fast. And here's the thing we need to understand. Jesus is telling us here that there should be an infectious joy in us that's unstoppable. And I think we need a little bit more of Tigger in us than Eeyore at times. Amen? We need that. This is the kind of joy frequently, frequently demonstrated by the early church. In fact, I want to give you just uh, such an example. So Jesus has been resurrected. The church has been um, born. The Holy Spirit has descended upon the followers. Saul, who at first persecuted the church, was converted on the road to Damascus, and he's now called Paul. And Paul and Silas are ministering to the people and believers in Philippi. Great things are going on. Man, the Holy Spirit's moving. People are being born again. And once they were heading to prayer, and this girl starts following them. She has a spirit in her by which she would predict things. And she follows along after Paul's house, and she's shouting out, listen to these men. They're sharing with you uh, the words of the Most High. Uh, They're telling you the way to be saved. And this went on day after day after day. And I love how this occurs. Paul, it's kind of like almost a matter of fact kind of thing, almost a a little bit, all right, if I have to. He turns around to the girl, and he rebukes the spirit in her because he just got tired of this. And so she's delivered from the spirit that used to possess her. And her masters are upset because that was their means of making money. And now they just took their means of making money away from them. And so they get the town behind them and they get, you know, everybody kind of torqued up. And so the authorities arrest Paul and Silas. And we're told they throw them into the inner prison. Now, in the, in the Roman culture, you had two prisons in their, in their prison institutions. You had the outer prison, which was kind of like a come-and-go place. And then you had the inner prison. It was a veritable dungeon. The only light that would come into your room was when they opened the door, and the only fresh air would be when they had opened the door. That's where they, sh- they throw Paul and Silas into this prison. Now, they also were told, put their feet in stocks. So there's things that locked around your feet. And so you sat there and you're super uncomfortable. I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm beginning to understand uncomfortable more as I age. I get up to go to the bathroom. It's a pathetic sight. Some of you know what I'm talking about? I get up and go, oh my goodness. I can't hardly walk. My knees sore. My back sore. I'm just thinking, oh, and I hobble. If you could show me, if you had like, you know, night vision, I'd, you'd say, who is that guy walking around looking like he's just crumpled over? That's me in the night. Can you imagine being in stocks? Can you imagine the uncomfortableness? It's meant to be uncomfortable. So here's what we're going to do. And you at home, tune in. You're going to do this too. Because all it takes is a chair. Are you all sitting in a chair right now? Not a trick question. You're all sitting down. So here's what we're going to do right now. So we can pretend we're in stocks. You can do this at home. Whether you're in Aberdeen or, or Huron or Watertown. You can do this at home too with us. You can join us. So you just sit here and we're going to do this. You ever do this? Because it's good exercise. You just lift your legs up. Just sit there and lift it. Kids, you can do it too. Don't put them down until I tell you you can put them down. Hmm. Just got a little dicey, didn't it? Sit there and hold them up because your legs are in stock. All right? If nothing else, it's a little, little teeny bit of a work of a core, a little bit of 
quad workout. Some of you guys care about that kind of stuff. I, I honestly don't, but anyway. So they're beaten up. They're in this dark dungeon. It's stifling. It, they got their feet in stocks. They're uncomfortable. How would you react? Oh, happy day. <laughs> right? We'd sing our Christian songs. Oh, happy day. No, most of us would go, wah, wah, wah. I mean, just look at the COVID-19 response. We're not really being persecuted yet. There's a lot of, lot of anger and frustration and pity going on right now. We're not singing, oh, happy day. But we're told that Paul and Silas, they're in the stocks. They're in this dark, dingy prison. And what are they doing? They're singing. And they're praising God. Because they're filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. Circumstances aren't determining the reaction. The Holy Spirit's determining the reaction, and they're full of joy. The joy of the Lord was their strength. Circumstances really couldn't be worse for them. They had to be uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable at that moment. But yet they prayed and they sang. Most likely they were reciting psalms and, 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 and singing them out loud. And I don't know how you respond to adversity in your life, but I don't even come close to this. My normal response is Eeyore, first of all, right? Once in a while, I'll get to Tigger, but it takes me a while thinking it through. So I'm just pathetic at times. How about you, honestly? How about you at home? Are you, are, how, how do you do in times of adversity? You know, we get all upset. We get all bent out of shape when we're inconvenienced a little bit. I mean, when I'm in a line of cars, more than 10 cars at Brookings, I'm, I'm upset. I have to wait, seriously, three minutes? This is hard. And, and we, we just have to understand that God wants to come and fill our lives with his joy. Now, you can put your feet down if you want. Some of you are type A's, overachievers. You just keep them up. Just keep them up as long as you want. The whole service long if you can. I don't really care. Good for you. Um, so we're real close now to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we absolutely need to know some things about joy. That's why he's sharing this. We need to know about joy. We need to be a decision, or we need to make a decision that we're going to be people who are, are governed by, by joy. And we need to understand that the Holy Spirit will fill us, and part of the fruit of that filling is joy. So if you're lacking joy, what do you do? You ask the Holy Spirit to produce that fruit in your life. The same goes for love. If you're lacking love, you ask the Lord to, to fill you more with the Holy Spirit so that you're not lacking love. And he will, I think, gladly answer that prayer. So let's talk on some basics of joy. Talk on some basics of joy. Happiness does not equate to joy. Amen? Happiness depends on right happenings. Lately, I've been taking a course from Yale uh, University entitled uh, Wellness and, and, and Well-Being, okay? I've been taking this class. And, and interestingly enough, and I understand this is from Yale University, and so I, I, it's just been an interesting class. They talked a lot on happiness, and I want to dispel some things about happiness for you that even the world that is secular is concluding. They did a lot of studies here, and they talked about what makes a person happy. And they said, does making a lot of money make people happy? They did a study. And here's interestingly enough, when, when people reach $75,000 of, of annual income together as a family, nothing more than that makes them any happier. It, they're just, at that, to that point, they said, we're, we're, we become, we can do what we need to do, we can survive, we don't have to worry about money all the time, blah, 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 whatever. But really, a millionaire, a billionaire, they're not any more happy than somebody that makes $76,000 a year. So that's a secular uh, study. And then, the, then they went on and they said, does awesome stuff make you happy? You know, all that jet ski or that motorcycle. And they go, no. In fact, they found that people in 1940s that had way less stuff than we have today were happier. Does true love make you happy? Some of you who are young and engaged, I don't want to burst your bubble. It works for about a year. Amen? For about a year, you're happier. Then after that, uh-uh. Now, that's not to be a downer. You can work at it. I'm, Vicky's watching. I'm happy to be married to you for 42 years. So, um, but there, that, that romantic thing is gone, and you're back to yourself, and you go, 
You look at each other and go, I don't know if I even like you, much less want to be married to you right now, you know. The reality of the longevity of it sets in. Um, Then this is really interesting. Weight and all that kind of stuff, that big deal in our country right now, right? And so they did a study of 2,000 people who were pretty obese that went on these diets and they found that there were three different outcomes. Get what what they were. Uh, Nothing happened at all. Some lost tremendous amounts of weight, and of course others gained weight as they were trying to lose. They found out that the group that lost weight, do you think they were the happiest? They were the saddest and the most messed up. Now, I'm not giving you guys an excuse, but they found that the group that lost the most weight was just totally dissatisfied still with the way they looked. I think they thought an outcome would be different, but you know what? I have a saying I always used to say all the time, where you go, there you are. If you are the problem, no matter what you do, you're still there. And you still have to solve that problem. And then they did the same kind of thing looking at cosmetic surgeries. And there was nothing but negative results. The more people got cosmetic surgeries, the more negative they became. And it didn't help at all. And here's what I'm simply trying to say here is happiness, even, even happiness is a fleeting thing for most people. And it's so dependent upon happenings. And even if you get the right happenings, you're still not what? You're still not happy. And so we have to listen to what the Lord is saying. He's talking about something that's greater than happiness. He's talking about this thing called joy. And happiness is an emotional response to favorable circumstances. And what I'm talking about with you when it comes to joy is nothing to do with an emotional response to favorable circumstances. Um, Joy is way more than an emotion. It's way more uh, than, than a feeling. Um, so let's talk about and define what is joy. What is joy? Let me define that for you. Listen to this. Joy is the gladness of the heart that is in relationship with Jesus. That's joy. It's this gladness of the heart that's in relationship with Jesus. So it's not circumstance driven. It's relationship dependent. It's not just an emotion. It's something much deeper. It is fruit of the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk with you now after this definition. So you've seen that that joy is not an emotion. Amen? It's something much, much deeper. So let's talk in some building blocks of joy because we're given a couple building blocks of joy here in the scripture that I read to you today. And I just want to quickly go over those. Um, The disciples were wondering, what in the world's going on with Jesus? They didn't know what was going on. We're not going to see you, then we're going to see you. Of course, he's talking about his death and his resurrection. And so we have to understand that joy has a foundation of resurrection. Joy has a foundation of resurrection. It's the first building block. If you're going to be a joyous person, you really need to understand resurrection and its implications. And did you notice that Jesus uses that, 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 that uh, good old analogy that we often hear uh, of birth? And he says, like a, a mother goes through this birthing process and goes through that anguish it's, and then has a baby. She forgets all that anguish she goes through when the baby is born because the joy of that new life overwhelms her. I, I've been through this birthing thing six times. Some of you have been through it several times too. And we watched all these films and I got a kick out of the films I watched, especially back, especially back in the 1980s, you know. And they, they would show these, these moms, they're, they're doing, you know, the ha, ha, ha. She's in birth and she looks at her husband and says, hey, you. You know what I mean? You did this to me. This was the films that they were showing us. One lady cold cocked her husband. Just boom. You did this to me. And I thought, are you going to do that to me, Vicky? When we get in there? Because you're really a, a nice girl. You wouldn't do that, right? And you know, that was not the time that the instructor said, that's not the time to talk to her about having another child. <laughs> it's not the time for you to say, this is so much fun. Let's do it again. This is a time for most husbands who are smart and have any kind of relational know-all at all to shut their mouth and say, I love you unconditionally, honey. We'll get through this, right? And Jesus says, here, once that baby is born, the mom forgets all that anguish. Why? Because of the joy of the new life that God has graced them with. And he's likening this to his death and his resurrection. He says, you're going to go through this mourning, this deep grieving as people when I die. But then I'm going to be resurrected. And you know, going to have this joy and understanding. Wow, everything that Jesus claimed is true. Everything he said is, is right. Everything he's ever articulated, we can trust. And you, you're going to forget Jesus is all the anguish. And you're going to just be full of joy because of resurrection. 
See, resurrection puts a stamp of authenticity to the claim to Jesus. It stamps authenticity to this, this, this claim that he is the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. It, it stamps authenticity on this claim that he came from the Father, and he's going back uh, to the Father. And to you and I who trust in him, we become ones who are full of joy. Now listen, no one, no one can take the joy of Jesus from you. Amen? No one can take that joy from you. In fact, I would like you to say that with me, only I'd like you to personalize it from you to from me. And I want you to say this out loud. If you're at home, I want you to say this out loud with me too. It's important for you to say this. Say it together with me. No one can take the joy of Jesus from me. You can give it away. You can stifle it. You can do some things to kind of quench it, but no one can take it away. Amen? It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's based on things like the resurrection. Earlier on in this ministry, Jesus sent out the 72 to um, go ahead of him to these cities and to prepare them for his arrival. And they were given the, uh, you know, giftedness to do miracles and healings and all that kind of stuff. And they returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They were jazzed. They were excited. And what did Jesus say? He said, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice instead that your names are written in the book of life. Your names are written in heaven. And what he was saying to them, instead of rejoicing in this power of God manifested, rejoice that you're born again in me and that your names are written in heaven, that there's really a truly uh, a resurrection. If we base our joy, friends, on anything else, we're going to find our joy dissipating and going away in times of trouble and circumstances. Those 72 that were rejoicing and that the demons submit to them, they too would suffer in their lives, right? They too would come into hard circumstances. And Jesus is saying, have your joy based on who I am and the fact that like I have been resurrected, you too will be resurrected. Now remember, this teaching of joy comes right after another mention of the Holy Spirit in the book of John. And once again, at the end of chapter 15 of John, the beginning of chapter 17, Jesus promises once again that the Holy Spirit would come when he departed. And as we read in Galatians, there's going to be fruit of the Spirit associated with the coming of the person of the Holy Spirit. Joy should become embedded in you. It is who you are. Eventually, it should make its way to the surface, uh, whatever you're facing. And, and, and if you struggle with joy, again, I'm going to just say this. I know I'm saying this, and I sound like I'm repeating myself to myself. I don't know if it's coming across to you. But if you lack joy, ask God for joy. Amen? Ask him to fill you with joy. Be honest. Are you more Eeyore or are you more Tigger today? If you're more Eeyore, ask God, give me joy. I want to experience your joy and strength. I want to experience that fruit uh, of the Holy Spirit. Um, so Jesus was going to go to the Father. They couldn't personally ask him any more of their questions. Um, but they could ask him for things now in his name. And they would, at one point, Jesus was saying, the disciples would realize, I really am God. They would realize that about Jesus. He, everything he claimed would really be true. And then their joy would be full. That's how the scripture that we read today ended. And so this brings us to building block number two. Listen to this. Your joy becomes full as you embrace the truth of Jesus' claims and the truth of his teachings. What did Jesus claim? I come from the Father, I go back to the Father. That's what he was claiming. I am God. I'm God incarnate. And when Jesus says, your joy now will be complete as you begin to understand this, what he's saying by that word complete is not that it's done, it will be full It'll be, you know, overwhelming. It'll be all uh, encompassing. In fact, complete could be defined this way. Full like a net full of fish or a house filled with the aroma of perfume. It'll be pervasive. It'll be all encompassing in your life. And we're to be people who follow Jesus with this all encompassing, pervasive, smelly joy. Amen? That everybody else that comes around us goes, what's going on here? Is that you? Because it's not me very often. It is me sometimes. More frequently, I'm going, oh, it's hard. I guess so, right? I'm being Eeyore, sorry. Let me give you an example of what joy means. And this is a, this is a, it's a hard example, but I, 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 I think it's appropriate. There is going to be a time in your life as a, as a person that you will bury a loved one. It's inevitable. And at that moment, your joy will be tested. 
And if that loved one especially knows Jesus Christ, then even as you're in the midst of this anguish and deep, deep sorrow, you know that the claims of Jesus are true. You know that as he's promised, I've gone to prepare a place for you. If so, I'm going to come back at you. You know that that dearly departed loved one is now experiencing the reality of that promise. You know that in your soul of souls. Amen? And you, you rest on that and you rely upon that kind of thing. You rest on the fact that Jesus said, I love you with an undying love and, and I'll never forsake you nor I'll never leave you. And those truths begin to percolate someplace in your soul. And even in the midst of all this terrible anguish, what do you have? Joy. Because joy is not an emotion. It is a condition of the person of the Holy Spirit within us. It is something that we're to become. So here's the question I want to end with today. Why don't we experience this more? And I'm going to talk with you for a couple moments on joy busters. No one can take away your joy, but you can really squelch it. And there are a couple ways you can do that. First way is this, by adopting a sinful lifestyle. When we choose as a follower of God to live in a way contrary to the ways of God, it will destroy joy in us. This very thing happened to King David. King David should have been to war with his troops. Instead, he stayed home. He saw the beautiful Bathsheba. A lot of us know that story. And he decided, I want that woman. But she was married to another man, a faithful one of his uh, servants, one of his warriors, uh, Uriah the Hittite. And, and David impulsively said, get her for me. I want her now. And he committed adultery with her. And then the consequences of the sin just blew up in his face as she became pregnant. And so he continued to scheme, and he said, oh boy, now she's pregnant. So then he called Hitt the Uriah the Hittite back from the war and said, here, be with your wife, hoping that he would have a relationship, sexual relationship with his wife, and that would cover up his sin. But Uriah the Hittite, being a righteous man, would not do that because he knew his fellow warriors were out there suffering. And so he said, I'm not going to do that. He, it just is ironic when you read the whole story. And so David gives Uriah a letter, a sealed letter to give to his commander that basically said, put Uriah the Hittite in front of every, everything uh, as you advance against the enemy, and then withdraw from him, and then the enemies killed Uriah the Hittite. Hittite. It's just a terrible story. It's a terrible story. And uh, we see the lengths that people will go to sometimes to, you know, cover up sin and to deal with sin in their life. And in all this, we know that David lost the joy of his salvation. He's living a lifestyle of sin. And then Nathan the prophet comes to him and confronts him. And David repents. And that leads to his restoration. And I love what Psalm 51 says. It's a confession of David about this time and this sin. He said, uh, he, he pleads for God, forgive me for my, 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 my sin. And in verse 12, this is really telling. He specifically says, God, ask God this. Restore to me, what? The joy of my salvation. Because the sinful lifestyle squelches it. It's a, it's a joy buster. And so sometimes if we're not experiencing joy in our lives, we've got to ask, am I doing something God contrary to you? Am I lacking faith? Am I living in a way of sin that I need to address? And then be willing to repent. Second joy buster is just wrong theology. Wrong understanding of who God is and how he works. Um, Erwin McManus, I quoted him last week in our message, he has a great saying on wrong theology and where it can lead you to wrong uh, places in your life. He said he had heard this saying, and he just didn't like the saying. It goes like this. The safest place is to be in the center of God's will. And he just, he just went crazy on this one time when I heard him talk. He said, no, that's bad theology. It is not safe to be in the center of God's will. It's the best but it's by no means the safest place. If you're in the center of God's will, he may call you to be a martyr. There's nothing safe about being God's will. It's just where you should be. But if that's your theology, thinking that if, I, if I'm safe in the center of God's will, then you're going to say, my kids should never get harmed, I should never get harmed, we should never experience any trial or tribulation. And it's going to lead you to questioning and blaming God when things go awry in your life because you have bad theology. And frequently, the reason that we suffer and our joy is destroyed is we have a misunderstanding who God is and what he's promised to us. And it leads us astray. Jesus promised us this in John 16, the very chapter we're at right now. In John chapter 16, verse 33. Not very many people quote this. He promises us this. In this world, you will have trouble. Anybody quote that? Because that's a promise of Jesus. But then he goes on to say, but take heart, I have overcome this world. 
Christianity does not mean trouble-free living. It just simply means the best living. And that if we understand that, then our joy won't be squelched when we face some adversity. I'm going to end with this real quick illustration. Years ago, we had a week in the Norby household called the week of the spilled milk. And Vicki and I were out praying this last Wednesday. By the way, every Wednesday we have prayer. And you could sign up for a half hour slot. I want to encourage you to do that and pray. And use this time we're in to, to seek God. So we're walking and praying around the parking lot, Vicki and I. And we get to the end and we're walking back to the church. And I don't know why she mentioned this. I think partly because she was looking at my notes uh, for the message. And she, she does the editing. And she says, do you remember the week of the spilled milk? I said, I do remember that. It was not a good week. And so what happened was, our kids were all little, and we'd sit down and have our big dinner at night, and it began with one of the kids just spilling milk on me. The kid next to me spilt their milk, and it went all over me. And I got up, I was rats, and just, you know, and I could handle it, because it was the first time, right? You know, you're gracious, say, oh, every now and then we spilled the milk. Well, then it happened the next night, exact same thing. And I said, really? And I get up, you know, and now, by strength of will and by, you know, my own sort of self-control, I can handle it. Then it happened a third time. Same thing, I got up, I go, are you kidding? Now I'm starting to lose some of my demeanor and some of my patience, because it's three times in a row. Then it happened a fourth time. And that time I'm going, really? Where am I going to sit where I don't get milk spilled on me? You see, I'm trying to change. By the fifth time I'm going, oh man, this is getting ridiculous. Happened a sixth time. And I'm going, what's going on here? Is there a conspiracy? Surely there's a conspiracy. This is a hoax. No, I'm just joking. Sorry. It's using some of the language I hear you thrown around and bantered with now. So then the seventh time, I spilt my own milk. <laughs> and over it goes. And I didn't show that up there, but this was me about week, day four or five. I looked like that dude in the little green t-shirt. I'm just going, why me? Why are you spilling milk on me all the time? And here's the deal. Here's why I'm sharing this. So we go through this COVID-19, and by strength of our will, the first month we go, we can do this. Hey, uh, this is a good break, right? I'm holding hands with my wife walking. We're all friendly. Everybody's saying hi. We're in this together, you know, because by strength of will, we can handle anything. Amen? Amen. By about week six, we're going, what is going on? This is terrible. My kids are home all day. I saw all this face of, oh my, I can't hardly really do this. These kids are here, they're staring at me. I don't know what to do with them all day long, right? It's so hard. And we're no longer having the good attitude. And then we get to week nine and 10. And we're going, are you kidding? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? This is never going to end, right? And what's spilling out of us is what's really in us. And I had a really good laugh about the spilled milk back then. And I thought, oh, I should be more patient and more loving of my kids because I spilled them out myself, you know. What needs to spill out of us right now more than anything, brothers and sisters, in Jesus is joy.